everyone. I'm Vicki Goodman, and on behalf of the Friends of the Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior, it is my pleasure to welcome you to this evening's Open Mind presentation. We are really thrilled to have this opportunity to screen Sam Coleman's award-winning documentary film, Art and Craft. This critically acclaimed film, which Sam directed, shot, and produced, was on the short list for the 2015 Academy Award Best Documentary, and also won the National Board of Review's Top Five Documentaries in 2014. We are honored to have Sam Coleman here with us this evening to introduce his film. Let's give him a warm round of applause. I might also add that he's traveled from New York to be here. And of course, we welcome him with beautiful Southern California weather. Eat your heart out. Um, also with this, e this evening from the Semmel Institute is Dr. Stephen Martyr, who is one of the world's most renowned experts on schizophrenia. Dr. Martyr's research has focused on the drug treatment of schizophrenia and the pharmacology of antipsychotic drugs. He has authored or co-authored more than 200 journal articles and chapters based on his own research. He is currently the director of the Mental Illness Research Educational Clinical Center at the Veterans Administration and the director of the Section on Psychosis at the UCLA Semmel Institute for Neuroscience and Human Behavior. After the screening, we will have a discussion and question and answer session. It will be at it will be moderated by our faculty advisor, Dr. Andrew Luchter, who is a professor of psychiatry and biobehavioral sciences at the David Geffen School of Medicine. He's also the director of the Brain, Behavior, and Pharmacology Laboratory at the Semmel Institute. Um, we won't be taking questions from the floor, but we will be passing out index cards where you can write down your question, um, pass it to the aisle, and someone will come by to pick it up. Um, this makes for a really lively discussion and really excellent questions to um, give to our discussants. So tonight's program, for those of you who have not been with, here with us before, it's part of our Open Mind Community Lecture and Film Series. Uh, we bring these programs to the community um, about mental health issues. We invite renowned authors, filmmakers, and scientists from the Semmel Institute to present programs about mental health. Since we started the Open Minds series in 2006, we've had close to 60 Open Minds. Um, we've welcomed authors such as Temple Grandin, uh, Pulitzer Prize winning author Ron Suskind, Andrew Solomon. We've screened films such as Thin, um, Glenn Campbell, I'll Be Me, et cetera, et cetera. You can see a complete listing of all of our past events on our website, friendsofthesemmelinstitute.org. Now, none of this would be possible without the support of our members. And for those of you who've already joined the Friends, I, I can't thank you enough for your support. Um, those of you who haven't yet, if you feel that the programs that we bring to the community are, uh, provide a service, that uh, they move you personally and emotionally, and that you learn something new when you come to our programs, I hope you will consider supporting us. So now it is my pleasure to introduce Sam Coleman. He is a cinematographer, producer, and director of documentaries. In addition to art and craft, Sam co-directed, shot, and produced if a Tree Falls in 2011, which won the U.S. Documentary Editing Award and at the 2011 Sundance Film Festival, and later received an Academy Award nomination for Best Documentary Feature. He also produced and shot the Peabody and Sundance Grand Jury, The House I Live in 2000, in 2012, and later that year, he directed, shot, and produced the documentary short Black Cherokee. In addition to his camera work on his own films, Sam's cinematography has also appeared in dozens of other documentaries, including Watchers of the Sky, 
Reagan, and King Corn. A graduate of Brown University in 1999 with honors in visual art and a second major in urban studies, Sam currently lives and works in Brooklyn, New York. Please join me in giving a warm welcome to Sam Coleman. Thank you so much for coming, everyone. It's, uh, it's really a pleasure to be here, and, and I'm so grateful to Vicki and the Semmel Institute for bringing me out here. It's, uh, uh, it's really it's a treat and and really grateful to you all for spending a Friday night to to watch this film. Um, uh, not much to say before uh, it screens because uh, hopefully we can talk about it afterwards. Um, do want to give uh, credit where credit is due. I, I did not make this film alone, and I did have partners, so uh, they're not here tonight, but uh, they're here in spirit. Uh, I had a partner named Jennifer Grossman who directed this with me, and, and a co-director named Mark Becker, who was also the editor of the film. Um, so anyways, uh, I, I hope you guys enjoy it and it, uh, look forward to talking afterwards. Thank you. So Sam, uh, an amazing film, uh, a wonderful story. Uh, let me uh, start by inviting Steve to say a few words about things and then we'll have a discussion and and we're uh, circulating in the audience with question cards we'll take some questions as well and uh, have a discussion going so okay yeah again my congratulations to sam for what i think is absolutely wonderful film i was i was probably asked to be the speaker because um schizophrenia is my area of interest but i really don't think that this film is about schizophrenia I, I really think that saying that this man has schizophrenia tells you almost nothing about him. It's, I think people have this illusion that when you can label something, you understand it. I, I think it's much more a film about, uh, about a man who's become socially disconnected, a man who clearly has had a very serious mental illness and has become socially disconnected. His um, his life is spent, it's not driven by delusions. He understands precisely what he's doing, but the reason why he does these things, like act as a benefactor or a priest, is because it's gratifying and, and it meets a, uh, a need that he has. Social disconnection is a manifestation of not just illnesses like schizophrenia, but of other things like um, some forms of depression, uh, autism, and, and a, a myriad of, of psychiatric illnesses uh, leads people to be socially disconnected. This is a, uh, there have actually been studies of social disconnection and it's, it's a serious problem. Uh, people who are defined as socially disconnected they have high rates of suicide. They die young. Being socially disconnected uh, detracts from your life to the same degree that smoking cigarettes or being obese uh, detracts from your life. Moreover, it's painful. Uh, the, uh, a very, f an, an outstanding uh, psychologist from uh, UCLA uh, Naomi Eisenberger uh, did a study where she uh, looked at uh, the idea of being socially excluded, as I believe Mark Landis was at times of his life, and found that people experience the same kind of pain and the same kind of brain centers that they feel physical pain. Areas, specifically areas of brain like the anterior cingulate and the anterior insula, these places light up just, they're activated just as they are by, um, by serious physical pain. And I s suspect that the story with Mark Landis is that after a, um, a period of time which seemed to have arisen during his uh, early adolescence uh, that uh, he must have been excluded and now his 
way of contacting people, of being, of getting contact, is to sort of put in this fantasy world that he seems to live in. He seems like a profoundly unhappy man who tries to get gratification from taking on these roles. Um, our group uh, uh, at UCLA in, in the Semmel Institute has been very interested in, in why people with psychotic illnesses become socially disconnected. Um, with some, it's things like suspiciousness or hallucinations. Those don't seem to be, at least at this stage of Landis's life, doesn't seem to be a, a driving force. Um, what I suspect is the very awkwardness of the man uh, suggests that uh, he doesn't have the uh, ability to socially connect with people that one would say is normal. So for example, uh, people are uh, human beings. We're supposed to be affiliated with one another. That's where we get safe. We, we have this, this natural sort of longing to be among the other and to interact. But it takes certain skills to do this. And uh, skills that seem to be impaired with Landis, for example, uh, being able to pick up social cues uh, by looking at faces and recognizing emotions in others, being able to mentalize, being able to put yourself in other people's shoes so that you're socially appropriate. These seem to be things that uh, Landis must have lacked at some time in his life, which led to this you know, current condition that he's in. Um, in any case, we, we've actually developed treatments for it because we consider it to be treatable. And uh, in our laboratory, we're extremely interested in that. But let, let me stop there and just congratulate you, Sam, for uh, just shedding a light on a particular aspect of mental illness, which uh, I just, uh, I, I think it's like really good artists. You're able to shed light on something that um, really most of us haven't talked about and isn't talked about enough when we talk about the, the problems of people with serious mental illness. Great. Thank, thank you very much, Steve. Um, Sam, uh, really, I mean, a, a fascinating, <coughs> excuse me, a fascinating study from my perspective of two characters, um, uh, both the, the, the hunted and the hunter. Um, and uh, uh, several of the questions that we have are uh, come, come in asking, how did you come on this story? What drove you to make this? Uh, so perhaps you could give us your, a little bit of your background in terms of uh, how you came to see this project, how you developed it, and, and your own interest in this. Yeah, sure. Um, so yeah, the, the story um, revealed itself to us actually through an article in the New York Times. Uh, my partner, Jennifer Grausman, uh, read the story and was immediately taken by it. And she you know, tore it out and kind of couldn't stop thinking about it. And before I knew it, uh, I got a call from her. We, we knew each other, but not particularly well. Uh, and she really just wanted me to shoot. Uh, f uh, and, and the Times, uh, interestingly enough, had not yet tracked down Mark Landis. Um, so the story was written entirely from the perspective of the curators who had been duped, um, and, and particularly M uh, Matt Leininger, um, who's the hunter. Um, <laughs> uh, and, and so Matt was findable, and, and so that's where she started. And so we flew out to Cincinnati, and we did an interview with him. And it was totally interesting, but you know, we had to meet Mark. Um, and, uh, and I think you know, at that stage, it was really, for Jennifer anyways, and, and certainly for me, to be with my own background in the arts, it was really, in our minds, a film about the art world and a film about um, you know, forgery and a film about you know, uh, questions of creativity and authenticity, originality, all that kind of stuff. Um, but once we met Mark, uh, you know, it was clear that the film was much bigger than that, or the story was much bigger than that, that he had much more to offer as a study of, of uh, you know, uh, as, as, as for a film. Um, and, and it was kind of immediately on meeting Mark that we knew that there was a film and she could see that I was connecting with it, you know, beyond just being a camera, you know, work for hire. And so uh, we, you know, pretty immediately started a partnership, uh, you know, where both of us would be directing the film. Um, you know, it's, 
um, you know, without saying much more than that, because I'm sure there are other questions, but you know, in, in meeting Mark, uh, you know, we realize it's one of those things as a, as a documentary filmmaker, you have to sort of respond to what's in front of you. And, um, and you know, we had to sort of let go of all the art questions to a certain extent. They were there, they were gonna be there anyways. Um, but it was a film that was really less about the questions of authenticity in art and more maybe about questions of authenticity and identity and, and how we construct our own identities. Um, you know, this here was a guy who was like obsessed with mo uh, movies and constantly was framing his interaction with the world and to us like to be able to express himself by referencing old films. And uh, you know, it, it just had these layers of, you know, uh, of these self-references -reference, uh, that was immediately fascinating. It's like as a filmmaker, you're just like, the hair stands back on, on, on the back of your neck because, you know, there, this is rich material and an and, and, and interesting thing to sort of uh, go back for. And, and that's something you really look for because these projects take years to make. You know, this one took three years. Um, and, you know, uh, the great thing about, uh, you know, where I feel very lucky to, to do what I do is that, you know, you, f you find uh, stories that, 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 continue, that continue to create a, a process of discovery, and, and this certainly was one. Um, I'm struck by you know, Steve's comment that this is a man who's profoundly socially disconnected. And a few of the questions we have here are about Mark's mental state. Um, and questions like, do you think he's happy? Do you think he's lonely? Does his work make him happy? Did you, did you see him happy during the project? Uh, certainly at times when he's on the screen, he seems quite animated. At the show, yeah. he, he looks like he's over the, over the moon. Uh, so your, your thoughts on, on that? Yeah, so I mean, that's, that's the one place where I, maybe I, I would love to hear more from you bec about that because I, you know, um, certainly we had the impression that he was, a, you know, a socially awkward person and that like he had these idiosyncrasies that, you know, probably drove him to be marginalized over the course of his life that created this isolation for him where he then, I, I totally agree, I think that his motivation was to connect with people um, and, and he created this uh, world for himself where he could and where he could, uh, you know, be given respect and, and communicate with people on terms that, you know, he understood and where he was safe and where, he uh, was in control. Um, but, you know, when we went and filmed that show, uh, we were expecting a public hanging. You know, we thought this guy was gonna be, you know, driven into the ground and just be embarrassed and he'd, you know, there was a lot of anxiety as you see in that scene before where he's, uh, you know, sort of stumbling and smoking and just, uh, you know, he, we were very worried for him. You know, we didn't know what was gonna happen. But we should have known better because we'd seen situations where Mark, when he actually connects with people, he becomes so animated. And that, that really was, I think that's the Mark that he, that he wants. And in fact, what I, when I look at that scene and, and think about that, that day, you know, he was actually in control. And, and maybe for the first time in his life, in control and, and not in a circumstances where he was uh, in a fantasy world. Like he wasn't in control under the circumstances where he was, you know, pretending to be a priest or a, you know, a benefactor or whatever it was. He was, you know, a forger and everybody knew it. And, and at that point, everybody was projecting their own needs onto him. You know, why can't you be an artist? Why can't you, you know, do this or do that? And, you know, that's, that, that I think that's another interesting part of this film where, um, you know, Mark became sort of this, uh, canvas where people wanted to project what they wanted onto him. And so like, you know, started with the New York Times article where the New York Times, you know, didn't even find him and, you know, probably didn't try very hard because the man was, you know, hiding in plain sight at his mother's apartment. Like if they dug, they would have found him. Um, <laughs> and instead they, they like implied that he was at large and that he was like some big bad, you know, forger who was out there to, you know, pull the wool over the eyes of the art world, which he did, but that of course was not his motive. Well, it wasn't his motive and it was his motive. I mean, that is, he, he wanted these to be seen as genuine works of art. Uh, it's complicated. I mean, I, I actually don't, um, I, he, he wasn't, you know, when we started, we thought like for sure, before having met him, that for sure he was either like, you know, a prankster trying to get one over on the art world to sort of show the power imbalances of tastes and subjectivity and all that kind of stuff, or maybe he was a disgruntled artist who was trying to get back at an art world that had rejected him, or, 
you know, like another idea was like he was a Robin Hood who was like trying to bring art to the masses and maybe that's what like you're picking up on. I actually don't think, I think Mark, it, like when he wants to be funny, which is often, uh, he's got a great sense of humor, he will like espouse those kinds of points of view just to get a rise out of people. <laughs> but I don't think that's what motivated him. I, I really don't. I mean, I, you know, I don't even know, uh, in the end, like he was forging artwork that he didn't even care about. Like lots of the artwork that he forged, like he laughs at. I mean, he like loves to like poke fun at Milton Avery, like like a three-year-old could paint, could draw that. And he like, you know, Picasso, like a five-year-old could paint that, I guess. You know, like he makes jokes like this all the time and he really means it. Like for him, like art was great, you know, before the modern era, you know, when it was like pretty pictures, as he says sort of at the end of the film, you know, pretty pictures about like, sappy things, that's, that's what he likes. Um, but he wasn't forging that stuff. It wasn't, it wasn't because he was forging it to get it into places to be this Robin Hood figure. It was something else. Yeah, I, I, I was thinking that the gratification he got wasn't that it was in the art museum. It was the process of giving it away. It was the process of his own living his fantasy of being a, a benefactor and a, uh, you know, pleasing his mother and his and his father, and looking like he was a person of of substance. It was that, at least from what I could see, that seemed to be where he got the uh, enjoyment. Once it was up, I don't think he visited it or had much interest in it anymore. Yeah. Yeah. He would he would give work away, uh, and it was really about that moment. And he didn't bother to check in whether they had kept the work or whether they put it up. It, it actually didn't matter to him so much. Um, it was like. You know, it was that moment, and it was that moment of like being connected, and, and I think he got a real uh, thrill out of like the sort of mischievousness involved, and you know, um, but it, it's not a mischievous, uh, like a pranky mischievousness. It's it's sort of like a childish mischievous mischie mischievousness. Yeah. Um, there's something else I wanted to say. I'll come back to it. Good. Um, Steve, a, a couple of the questions we have here are about. Um, uh, people with schizophrenia who uh, seem to have unusual outcomes or uh, unusual life stories. I mean, mm -hmm. certainly Landis's story is unusual. Uh, mm -hmm. uh, one of the questions here is about John Nash, and was his remission unusual? Was people who seem to do extraordinary things uh, with this illness? I mean, it, it kind of gets to the intersection of preserved capacities and illness, personalities and illness, uh, and coexisting illnesses. Um, I think there's a question in there somewhere. <laughs> <but> <laughs> well, you know, the thing is people who have schizophrenia have a range of outcomes like every other person, you know, uh, like, like people without schizophrenia, like people with diabetes, you know, f uh, you know, you know, from being, you know, you know, very severely and chronically ill, from being very accomplished, fully formed people, uh, and uh, I, th I think our the people who are in the community and struggling with schizophrenia but living lives are the ones we don't hear about. Uh, uh, when we were doing a study of uh, high functioning people with schizophrenia, we uh, found, you know, a number of them. They were physicians, lawyers, psychologists, uh, but they were very protective. Uh, you, you may recall there was an article in the New York Times about the study that, about a study that we did. And, uh, and I remember I got an email from uh, a judge somewhere in the Southwest who had talked about how he had schizophrenia and he was in treatment and he did, was doing very well and he intended to come out and reveal his illness as soon as he retires. Uh, the message being that the stigma of the illness is so great that, that, that we don't see it. So, so I think there are many people out there. John Nash is an odd example because he, um, he, he stopped medication. And I don't know if one would call it a, a, a totally good outcome. I mean, he was really not functional in his later life. You know, people probably know that, that he died in an automobile accident just last weekend, which was tragic. But dur during his later years, he was really not functioning as a teacher. He was doing some lecturing and uh, appearances. But uh, you really wonder whether an illness that was better treated, whether he could have even 
you know, had, had, had an even better and fuller life. Thank you. Um, there, there are a couple of interesting questions in here, Sam, which uh, I guess kind of surprised me when I see them. And uh, they're along the lines of, why do you think people want him to stop? And, and I, I have my own answers to that, but I, I think of it in the context of, I think, an even more interesting character of Laninger, who is absolutely obsessed with this guy, who I don't know to what extent he lost his job, I don't know to what extent he sees this as his job to, to do this. What, what was your take on Laninger? So um, Matt, uh, Matt is an interesting character without, without a doubt. I mean, he, um, I think he rubs people perhaps the wrong way because he was so uh, driven to go after somebody who seemed so uh, in innocuous at the end of the day. You know, um, he wasn't clearly a malicious uh, actor, but yet obviously he offended the very core of what it is that Matt does and what Matt is about. And not only is he guarded and very, uh, uh, you know, protective of like art world concepts of you know authorship and that kind of stuff. You know that cuts to, that cuts to the very point of like what it is that he cares about. But he's also an incredibly diligent, as he would say, uh, you know, uh, tenacious person. And 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 I think you know there what emerged as we were making the film was you know really through through Matt's own words and it's in the movie you hear him he, he talks about his own mental illnesses about like well I don't know if I'm ADD or this or that um, and it you know there there just emerged this parallel sort of uh, 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 parallel like characters uh, you know in pursuit of the flip side of a coin um, and that was that was very interesting to us um, yeah well, can I ask you do you think that um, Landis had any uh, idea that what he was doing was dishonest and, and, and ethically wrong? I mean, in the beginning, he was, I think at the very beginning, he was saying something like, well, everything is a copy, is, is a derivative of something else. Nothing is, nothing is really new under the sun. But I, I, you, you wonder whether, because what he did was, you know, I'm, I'm on one level just very dishonest. But I, I, do you think he appreciated that? I think I think there's sometimes Landis will like that line. I think uh, maybe maybe not his own. I think that might be a line that he you know read somewhere and, and thought it was clever. You know, uh, you know, looking back at what he had done. I mean, early on when we would try and get into sort of ethical conversations with him, he would he really I think genuinely didn't understand that he had like crossed a line that was so bad i mean he it, it's like that like he would say like it's not that bad come on it's really not that bad and he would say like uh you know john uh, gapper who's the financial times reporter who uh you know really broke the story open he was the first one who found mark landis actually um you know he's in the film he's a british guy uh you know he he would constantly mark would constantly refer to, to john gapper who thought that like people like matt leininger you know uh, getting so upset over like, you know, lost opportunity, like, the opportunity lo cost loss of, of, you know, spending too much time with a guy who's actually fraudulent, you know. Uh, John sympathized with that. I thought that like that was kind of a ridiculous statement. And, and in the end, the law would sympathize with that because, you know, uh, he may have perpetrated a fraud, but it was an unprosecutable fraud because at the end of the day, there was no monetary loss. And, you know, it, you could go after like, you know, the lost man hours of that kind of thing, but uh, no one really was going to do that. Um, yeah. Well, it's interesting because he, he clearly knew that in, on some level what he was doing was significantly wrong. He, he said his father would not, would be very disappointed in him because his father was a, a stand-up, very ethical guy. Yeah. Um, I, I loved his line where he said, where would the Catholic Church be if St. Peter hadn't lied? <laughs> <laughs> I laugh, but I'm Jewish. I don't really understand what <laughs> I mean. <laughs> I've got a Catholic wife. I'll explain it to you later. Right. Um, <laughs> cool. Uh, but he, he, he clearly knew what he was doing was wrong, but seemed, uh, my impression was at least, that he found the rewards of it so much greater than the, the guilt that he felt over it. Yeah, I mean, I think 
I think part of what he was saying in the, the father section uh, where he talks about his dad would have been disappointed by him is really just like a global thing that like, you know, his dad was like a handsome Navy guy, like, um, you know, with a career that, you know, unfortunately didn't pan out really how he wanted it to, to, but nonetheless, like he was hoping that his son would at least, you know, rise up to that level, if not higher. And I think, you know, to have a son who was, you know, uh, sort of an awkward kid and, you know, didn't really connect with people in the way that they had hoped, I think that's really what Mark was talking about because mm -hmm. his father passed away when he was 17. Um, so, you know, uh, his dad never, you know, would have known any of like the ruses that, that were to come in his life. Um, I, I, think, I think what he was more talking about is, yeah, this idea that he was sort of this marginalized figure who, you know, didn't have a family, didn't have, you know, uh, didn't have a career. Um, and really, like, I think, you know, this, uh, you know, this, this 30 year ruse of his was a way to have a career and a way to have a, an, you know, an avocation to have, you know, something to do, a purpose, you know, and, um, and that, you know, that to us was like a really interesting uh, thing and a, and, a, and a universalizing thing, you know, because it's really easy to look at folks with mental illness and sort of like to be like, you know, push them in a corner and, you know, that's them and I'm here, but, you know, we are all, you know, uh, uh, motivated by this desire to connect and to contribute to society in a way that I think Mark is as well. So, um, you know, and I, you know, without, uh, I, this probably is simplistic, but, I, um, you know, we are really encouraged, uh, you know, as filmmakers, we're, you know, art filmmakers with more art backgrounds, certainly than mental health backgrounds, as the film, like, started to take shape, um, we eventually started to reach out to some mental health, uh, you know, practitioners, people, you know, people with way more understanding of, of these issues than us. And we were really encouraged to hear that, you know, there are, there are uh, lots of, uh, you know, there's lots of uh, belief that, you know, that isolation and, you know, is a really problematic and sort of recurring issue for uh, folks who suffer from mental illness and it, it sort of like creates a spiral. Um, and it, you know, if the simplistic part is, you know, if only people could be, you know, uh, less isolated, then perhaps, you know, they wouldn't go to the lengths that, you know, that we read about in the newspaper. I mean, the, the funny thing about this story, right, is like, Mark, thank God, wasn't like taking a machine gun out into a movie theater, or like, you know, the kind of things you read about that are so horrible. Um, you know, his, his manifestation was something a little more innocuous, uh, thank God, but, um, you know, if, if, if only folks like him had more connectivity, maybe they wouldn't, you know, do this in the first place. Steve, you know, some of the questions get back to sort of where you started your remarks, and you talked about this not really being so much a manifestation of schizophrenia per se. Some of the questions say, you know, does he have something on the autism spectrum? And certainly he, he seems to have difficulties in relatedness. Mm -hmm. is, does he have something on the OCD spectrum? Uh, but it, it sounds like you don't really see this so much as a manifestation of a major mental illness as uh, a, a failure to integrate into society. Um, no, I, I, you know, my suspicion, you know, and, and again, not having, you know, as a psychiatrist, we're not supposed to like diagnose without seeing people. Uh, <laughs> and, uh, well, you've seen them. Yeah, right, right, <laughs> right, 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 right. But yeah, you know, you know, the, the the narrative that I believe is that he had a psychotic illness. He's on, you know, Geodon, Ziprazidone, an antipsychotic drug. His hallucinations and delusions are under control, and he has what some of us would call residuals of schizophrenia. He has the, you know, his affect is, is very blunted. His, uh, his oddness, his, uh, I was talking about his lack of um, social cognition and, and social skills, his, uh, you know, and, and it's not, I wouldn't say that he's not interested in um, socializing. He's just incapable of doing it. And except through this, you know, kind of fantasy world that, that, that he has. So I, I, I mean, I, taking everything that I've seen, it's, you could make the argument that this would be very consistent with uh, major mental illness. He certainly seems like a very impaired man and I think if any of us, I mean, if you met him in that art museum and it wasn't like the artist himself, you would say, what is he, what is he doing here? I, I mean, you know, there, there was, he 
clearly is, is, is a very odd fellow. You know, we, um, we're going to close in just a moment, but I, I would be remiss if I didn't uh, ask you, Sam, about a number of the questions people have of things like, number one, where is he now? What is he doing? What's his life like now that this has come out? How did he support himself through this? Um, so could you enlighten us as to some of those things? So the, I'll just pick off an easy one. How does he support himself? Uh, it was something we really struggled to be able to uh, to uh, relate in the film itself, but it, it just never worked narratively, and so we just hoped that it would be implied enough, and I think it is a, a shortcoming of our film, unfortunately, that people are often asking us that question after after seeing it. Um, you know, he, uh, he, he lives in his mother's house. Uh, you know, she's deceased, right? And uh, he, like, lives virtually like a monk. You know, he, he eats, like, TV dinners and um, you know his major expenses are you know shopping at Walmart to for art, art supplies um, and gas to travel to go do these jaunts. Um, uh, but uh, clearly his mother, um, I mean hopefully it was clear, but I guess oftentimes it's not for folks that his mother like had some means. Um, she her second marriage, uh, her, who who, uh, who a man who has since passed away. Uh, left uh, her with some money, and when she passed away, she left Mark uh, that. that. Uh, but he also gets disability payments. Um, his father was in the Navy. He gets a pension from his father. Um, he's, not, he's not wanting um, in that way. Uh, and I think that's part of you know, the reason why he never decided, perhaps, to sell his artwork, you know, which you know, would have gotten him in, into real trouble, and, and thank God he didn't. Um, other questions about where he is now. So I'll just backtrack really quickly to that one thing I forgot to say, which is I think we'll get back to the where he is now question. So uh, Mark, someone asked, or one of the questions was like, is he happy? Is he ever happy? Do you ever see him happy? Like, um, so I think what started this whole thing off, right, for him was that he was a kid who was isolated, like first in, in the hotel rooms in Europe and uh, and then as, you know, as an early adolescent, like in high school, you know, like sort of the, the kid who was weird. And, and what he did, as he says, to comfort himself, to make him feel happy was to, to copy artwork. And he was really good at it. And like most things, when you're good at stuff, you, that gives you good feeling. And so he, you know, that initially was the seed that made him happy. I think when he came upon this concept of, you know, posing as a philanthropist, uh, he then became much more interested in the, the feelings of happiness he got from that interaction than actually making the artwork. And over time, he cared a lot less about making the artwork. And so you see him in the film, like tossing his artwork around the room like he doesn't care. And, that's, and that is because he really doesn't care. He, you know, for Mark, and he, he'll totally admit this, like, you know, if, it's, if he can't finish a piece within the time it takes to watch a movie, he doesn't want to do it. <laughs> <laughs> um, and all of his artwork is, you know, this big so it can fit into a suitcase, like he's not trying to do anything big, anything complicated. Um, it, you know, it is very much a means to an end for him now. I think at one point it was different, but now that's where his happiness is. Um, and then so now you ask where he is now, um, you know, what has been a really unexpected consequence of making this film is that he's, I think, happier now than he's ever been. And, um, and it's a, a real shock to us because so when we were making the movie, there was a lot of concern for us that, uh, this guy could, you know, wilt before our eyes. And, you know, before the exhibition, especially in that period, it, it was a really dark period in his life. You know, we weren't sure he was gonna make it, honestly. Um, and, uh, and, and a lot of that was because here was this thing that gave him meaning, gave him purpose, gave him, uh, you know, connection, and it was taken away from him because, uh, you know, as, as Gapper, John Gapper says in the film, like, you know, he suddenly could maybe not walk into an artwork, an art museum again to give his stuff away because, you know, people would know. Um, and so, you know, he, he, that had been taken away from him. And when you take that away from a guy like, like Mark, like, where does that leave you? And it's a really scary place. Amazingly, you know, as the media picked up on him, you know, before our film was released, The New Yorker did a profile about him. Uh, and then our film was released and, you know, thankfully people liked it and, you know, it was written about. And so now Mark has people coming out of the woodwork, you know, wanting to talk to him. And, and there's a woman who, an art forgery expert actually, who was a subject in our film, but we cut her because it just didn't work narratively, who really, like many people, took a real shine to Mark. Um, and what she did with, it was a, a collaboration with us, but really she took the ball and ran, and ran with it. She set up a website for him where he can take on commissions from folks. Um, 
It's called marklandisoriginal.com, and you can just go online, and he ha gets like fan mail way more than we get. Um, <laughs> and, and it's amazing. I mean, he like literally is having the time of his life. Um, so great, he's traveling the country, yeah. That, that is a wonderful way to close. Uh, before we do, um, let me thank you once again, Sam, for coming out and Thanks sharing your film yeah. with us. Uh, I mean, real, really an entrancing story of, I think, uh, at least two very interesting characters there, uh, and uh, really very powerful and, and uh, thought-provoking. So thank you very much. Thank you, thank you. Uh, Steve, thank you for coming out and sharing your evening with us and your insights into this into uh, illness and the characters that are involved. And uh, many thanks to all of you for coming out on a, a Friday evening and for sharing your evening with us. Uh, we have uh, another film coming up um, in just a few weeks, um, which I'm sure Vicki announced at the beginning, and I can't remember the data of right now, but it's on our website. Um, June 22nd, thank you, Sam. You're gonna be here, I hope. Um, so thank you all very much. If you all are members of the Friends, thank you so much for joining. Um, it's your support that makes evenings like this possible to be open and free to the public. And uh, please pick up an envelope in the foyer and continue to support the Friends. We hope to see you in a few weeks here. Thank you and good night. Thank you.